Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for the lunchtime webinar. My name's Marie, I'm the Advanced Practice Lead for Primary Care, um, so I'm your point of contact for primary care and I'm here to support you with any information on pathways, recognition and training routes um, and any other advice and guidance that you might need. I'll put my email in the chat box at the end of the presentation um, for you to contact me. Um, we're really pleased today to be joined by one of our regional colleagues, Christine, who's an advanced nurse practitioner and clinical lead working in the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough area. And she's very kindly agreed to share her story, um, advanced clinical practice with us. So I'm just going to unmute and you, Christine. Christine, has that worked? I think so. Oh. I just lost my mouse for a moment. <laughs> the arrow went missing. Okay. So, okay, so I'll say hello to everybody. I don't know if there's a few people out there that I might know, um, but if so, a double hello. Uh, what Marie's asked me is just to talk to you about how I became a, a, an advanced nurse practitioner, what it sort of means for me, um, the, the, the ups and the downs of it to a certain extent. Um, and also um, where we where I feel that the new framework is going to be um, helpful with advanced practice. So um, I suppose if I throw my mind back a long time ago, I think about advanced practice um, from years ago where we had no framework of any dis dis uh, description. It was all very much about um, what you did within your own organisation and um, if anybody can remember you know everything was about extended practice and doing extra things <clears throat> and then gradually as a, as, as, as a nurse by background as a nursing profession we began to bring that back or bring that more together but there never has been a real framework to hang it on so um, I work as an advanced nurse practitioner in general practice um, and I also work as a clinical service lead for a GP federation. So some of you may be familiar with GP federation, some of you may not. But what we do is we provide things like extended access and enhanced services to support um, a geographical area. Um, so that's a, basically working with a predominantly remote workforce. So there's, there's quite a few challenges there. And it's my job to ensure that <clears throat> from a governance and a quality point of view, that everything is, is in order. Um, I also happen to be the registered CQC manager for that organisation as well, which is, is another hat. Um, but I suppose mine all started off when um, I became um, initially worked in an A&E department. I left there and went into general practice as a practice nurse, but only for a couple of years. I then went into the community and worked as a respiratory specialist nurse and as a community matron and then going back to the respiratory um, world uh, specialist nurse. And in that time, I did my um, advanced practice MSc. But again, it was well before 2017. So I'm looking at the portfolio um, with interest to see where, where I go with that. Um, so I did, did all of that. And then after a while, I also did operational management when I was in working in the community services. And then after a while, I decided it was time for a change. So I went and approached um, a GP practice who I knew th through working with them, who already had uh, an advanced nurse practitioner and had a discussion with them about joining them as an advanced nurse practitioner. Uh, they were absolutely thrilled. They wanted me to come on board, which was great. And, you know, I have to say I fell on my feet with a very supportive practice. Um, lessons that I learned at that particular point in time. Uh, I suppose it's very hard to move from um, what is a big organisation like a community trust where you have a lot of support and structure, especially around things like supervision to go into a small GP practice essentially, which as you will know, are all individually owned businesses to have less support, um, potentially less supervision um, and maybe not to know what you need to negotiate at that time. So my reflection on that is that I probably should have had more structure to my supervision when I joined the practice. 
um, and looking what happens when we have um, medical students, uh, FY2s and GP registrars, they have this structure and looking at what's been said today is that with the framework, the organisational governance will hopefully improve and that structure will be there for nurse practitioners as well, well advanced practitioners. Um, it's, it's lovely now seeing all the advanced roles coming in and working with the first contact physios, etc. Um, so that's that's enhancing things a lot more and I think that's going to make a big difference. I think having that organisational um, structure will help with the uh, my practice was I was I was lucky they did support me very well, but I know that isn't always been the same for some of my colleagues um, and they've had to really fight their corner to get the time to have supervision, time to do um, the, 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 the leadership aspect of their jobs and, and, and every any aspect, including their own personal development and, and education. Um, so one of the things that I did uh, suggest to my practice is that we do put something together, especially as we um, are having a new nurse practitioner joining joining us. So I said what we need to do is to have something structured that she can work with because I, from my learning, which I shared with them, this is sort of more of what they need. The other thing I, I learned was that um, I work with a jolly good bunch of people who don't mind me asking questions and never have done. Um, but there's also a wider network out there. I learned to network with the specialist teams in the hospital and to work with the the, you know, the microbiologists and um, all, all the much wider team and the community teams to find solutions to challenges that I might be having, particularly with some of those more challenging patients. And, and I find that personally very satisfying because I like to stretch myself. I like to learn more on a, on a daily basis. And then obviously we, learn, we, we share that learning. Uh, I was thinking about what happens on a daily basis in, in practice. And this also goes across to my clinical services lead very much and how those things fit in with the, the four pillars. Um, and and I, I struggle with the word pillars because it makes me, I see a standalone structures, but I don't see it like that. I see the pillars as all being intertwined and there's so many, and I know that we've just been discussing that, but there's so many different aspects of what we actually do. So I made a little list, so don't mind me looking down. Um, so your own personal development obviously is, is, is something that you need to do but on a daily basis. We're making shared care decisions, not just with, with our patients, of course, but we're also making them with our colleagues, either across organisations or within our own within our own setting, within our own practices. Uh, we're doing a lot of work around patient education. Um, you know, we, we're giving patients information, hope, hoping that they're going to be looking at it. We're trying to make patients more independent so that they can manage their own conditions. You know, we're working with patient groups, so we're getting feedback through patient groups of friends and family, and we're learning from that, bringing that into practice and and hopefully, you know, coming out with some good uh, innovative practice that comes from that. Um, and I was thinking about innovative practice and I was thinking about COVID as well. And I was thinking, where, what happened when COVID hit? We, we didn't close our doors. We didn't all close down. We all found different ways of doing things. And, and that had organisational impacts and we did it together, but it also had personal impacts as to how we practice and, and how we adapted our practice. And, and, you know, I truly believe that's something we have to be extremely proud of as well. But then I was also looking in the wider the, the wider uh, work of what we do is we, we, we're always got overarching themes around safeguarding. So that's something that we, we work together with our with from a, a, a management point of view um, as well, because we have we have safeguarding meetings. I actually am the safeguarding lead for my federation as well. So there's there's lots of aspects of that that, that, that come into play. Um, significant events. Uh, they always happen. They're always going to happen. Hopefully, you know, we get we get more near misses than we get actual events. But the learning from that and the involvement in investigating those and and learning about the systems and how we can improve those systems and pass that knowledge on to our uh, our colleagues and and share it wider as well. It's a point, you know, practice A finding out that something was a problem. We ought to be sharing it wider and hopefully with emerging PCNs. Then that will that will actually make that that a lot different, uh, a lot easier. 
uh, complaints and compliments uh, again you know there's a lot to be learned from complaints and compliments it's nice to have a pat on the back but you know things don't always go right um, and a complaint is an opportunity to get things right and to learn from from what we've done in the past then all these in, uh, affect those those pillars there there's an aspect of, of every single one of those in there including um, looking at expert clinical practice I'm not going to go into that an awful lot but to say that you know if there's something clinically has gone wrong whether it's you personally or whether it's across the team then we all learn from that and that there's uh, again it's a no no uh, there's no blame to be involved in there um, and then um, audit um, bane of my life if I may say so I do an awful lot of audit especially within my clinical lead role because we have a remote workforce so the only way to really see what's happening is to conduct quite regular audits um, I do actually enjoy it and I enjoy the feedback and I would say 99% of the time when feedback goes out whether it's positive or whether it's suggesting improvements is what comes back to to me is a, a, a genuine thank you from staff because they I find that they wanting to improve their practice and when I'm saying staff there it's a, a mixture of um, administrative staff it's GPs it's AMPs it's practice nurses it's healthcare assistants so it's quite a big group of staff there um, and then um, the, the the learning that comes out of that those audits as well then take us on to to quality improvement and improving our practice and that's another big area that I get involved with I'm um, using evidence based based practice to produce guidelines and SOPs to make sure that everybody is communicated with for the um, the best practice that, that's out there at the time but it's also looking at it all quite regularly because everything changes and and keeping up to date um, so I think there's there's lots I could go on about, but my biggest hope from the from the framework is that we will get a structure. We will end up with um, being able to say to people, this is this is how I this is how you achieve this. This is how you get there. There is a roadmap. You can follow that, and you know you can say at the end of that, this is what I have achieved. This is my this is what I am capable. This is my these are my capabilities, uh, and that's never more obvious to me when I'm doing tutorials with uh, GP registrars um, or medical students or FY2s. That one of the things they always ask me is how do you become a nurse practitioner? And that is a really difficult question to, to answer. How do you become an advanced practitioner at the moment? And, you know, hopefully in the not too distant future, I can just give them the link to, to the framework and they can they can have a look at it for themselves. So um, I'm going to be quiet now. So, OK, hopefully if you, anybody's got any questions, just ask away. Christine, thank you so much for sharing such a lot of information in a real snapshot of time um, you've really broke the glass ceiling I think of being an advanced practitioner um, and obviously taking on the additional role and opportunity within your clinical lead role but also thank you for sharing within your AMP role how you're working against the four pillars and hopefully that will be really valuable um, to our attendees listening to recognise how they can also build some evidence against that as well and yes everyone please do obviously start to put your questions in the chat um, and the three of us will be happy to answer anything. Now on the last webinar this started off slow and then it snowballed quite quickly so I'm just putting it out there this is this is your opportunity we're, we're here to have the, the, the conversation that helps support so any questions no stupid questions um, we can hopefully help you if, if there is anything. Moenia, was there anything on the chat during the presentation? Has any questions been put through? No, nothing else has come up, Katie. We'll give it a couple of minutes just while people think about it. <laughs> if not, we can also give people half an hour of their lives back, which might be just as well appreciated at this point in time, Evelyn. <laughs> I think from my point of view, what I would say is that this is changing, that the environment of APs is changing, it's changing dramatically and we're really aware of that. And I think what needs to come out of all of this is that it needs to be a supportive process and that's what we're looking for. Um, 
we know we're changing the governance and the guidelines and the new capabilities are coming through. So it's just always continuing mapping. Mo majority of you will already have those skills. It's easier actually now for those who are qualified and coming out because the roadmaps are there to give them that kind of direction. Whereas I think it's more problematic at the moment for those who are experienced practitioners and where do they develop or, and, and how do they map against? So I think we're here to support that that process. That I think that's the key um, going forward. Now I've seen one question. Go on, Moenya. I was just about to read the question to you. Can you see it? Yeah, Is so framework pharmacists. Um, we are the pharmacist workforce, obviously, at the moment um, with the whole degree processes is under review and, and they're looking at changing that framework. So, yes, the plan is that there will be a framework for pharmacists, but I don't know where that is currently in, in being delivered. But we are looking at how we map it against the new um, degree foundation training to then what that then is for pharmacists going, going forward. So, yes, it, it's in development. Um, so we have a second question, which is, can we have examples of work that's been put in for credentialing? Um, yes, I think that would be really, really useful. Uh, the current thing that I can signpost you to is on the AHP HEE landing page. And there is an example of a case based discussion that's written at level seven. So that's something that's currently available. Um, and the other work, yes, we would definitely need to put something together to share. Yeah, we um, so we were looking at doing it regionally, but I've spoken to the national team and with the practitioners who led on the feasibility study for the portfolios, we've got task and finish groups end of September, October to put guidance together. So what is level seven evidence? What would be the type of evidence we're looking for across all of the four pillars? And, and as Christine rightly pointed out, they shouldn't be seen as, as individual pillars. It is a blended and your evidence for one piece will actually hopefully cover more than one one pillar and that shows the breadth of learning and understanding and how you you implement that so we are looking we have pushed for it and we have now got those tasks and finished groups so before those portfolio option gets released um, and we can start putting people through that the guidance will be there to help support it as well just reading Janet's the, the supportive portfolio is, is specifically for that so some people may have done a few MSc modules you know quite a few years ago it's that level seven right and it's the reflective um, piece that's required so what we have in the East of England coming up will be we've got 300 um, we have 300 funded places. The funder will go to the HEI. A um, hundred of those will go to primary care. This is just the first round. This is just us trying to make sure that the system works and, and, and the best way of developing this. It won't, that, that 300 won't be the end of it at all. It's just the starting process and we've got additional national funding to really help support that going forward. Um, and it is to enable then you'll have an HEI to be able to you know, do the learning needs assessment, really look at what evidence you've got and just put, point you in the right direction of either any additional learning or most of them have portfolio modules to show you how to just bring it all together. And that's what's going to be going to be key. And I think I just don't know that how long it's not time limited at the moment. I think it will be at some point at the moment with that initiation, that starting phase. Um, what we are saying is that we don't want the portfolio route to be open indefinitely because this is about supporting those who are our current advanced practitioners. Any new advanced practitioners should be taking or undertaking the full MSCs. That's what we're expecting. So that portfolio route is predominantly for our current ACP workforce. So it won't be there indefinitely. Um, but we don't have a time frame. We haven't even got it up and established. So we're going to have a couple of years of this without any, any huge issues. But yes, I think longer term we are discussing that this isn't, we would foresee that all new practitioners would go through the MSC route. That's what we would expect to see. Uh, we've got a hand up, Moenya, can you unmute? Sure I can. Leona. Is another question as well, Katie, from um, uh, from uh, Bernadette. How 
uh, many nurses submitting applications for credentialing and I'll unmute uh, Leona. Sorry, what was the one about credentialing? Many, how many nurses submitting applications for credentialing? Well, with HE, the portfolio, the portal isn't open as yet, so we don't know the actual numbers through that route. And we hope that many nurses will submit applications um, for recognition with the centre. I think I would say so from a professional point of view, the portal isn't open. If you're due to go through credentialing, continue to go through credentialing. What we're trying to do longer term is so that you wouldn't have to do both. If you were credentialed by the RCN, then you would then automatically go on to that, that national register as well. It's just that we're a little bit away off that. So, you know, being credentialed by your professional body is very much a very sensible thing to do and it shows that standard. So even as we're then coming through with the, the CQC and the governance of these roles, if you can show that you're credentialed by your professional body, it's a really good starting point to know that actually you are being able to map again against these. And then to say that you're then waiting for the professional bodies to join up, it, that's going to be a, a personal choice and also an organisational choice um, with how long we wait for that process or if you've credentialed with another, you know, with your professional body, realistically, it's going to be very, very easy for you to have that portfolio of evidence to then go on to the National Register. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, it is a, it isn't a pressure, it is a union, but they are seen and how they do the credentialing is, is, is how you support. So again, it, it it's up to you which route you want to take. We're, we're not going to force one or the other. I, I would... It's a difficult one from East of England, from my point of view, for that governance. We're currently saying that none of the credentialings completely match against the new national more professional framework. So by being on the register, that's what it's telling your organisation. And that's how we're, we're ensuring the governance wrapping around this workforce. It, it's work yet to be done is the honest answer. And, and that's how we're, we're trying to develop. There was a question just before Benedette that um, the surgery where I'm based are currently looking for an ACP and it is a new role being introduced. I'm currently working towards my MSc. Where would I be able to get some information to help develop this new role in primary care? Um, well, we, uh, myself and the regional faculty could support that. So if ready, if I put my email in um, and then we probably also could do some networking with other PCNs and practices that have that role established and session best practice from that as well. Um, Should we get to I've, Leona? She's yeah, been yeah. For a while. I've tried to unmute her. Leona, are you able to speak? Yeah, I, I'm here now. Sorry, yeah, I'm on my phone and it doesn't give me an option to type uh, my questions. Okay. But um, I'm in the similar situation from the person who just typed about uh, finishing there. I'm on my ACP pathway, uh, Masters in Advanced Clinical Practice, and I'm due to finish soon. Um, I, like the other person, is also starting a new role as an uh, advanced, as an ACP, and it's just about preparation. And my, my actual question, actually, is I just want to clarify, um, so if I finish, uh, once I qualify and get my master's, uh, do I automatically go on to the, um, go on and be registered uh, on the, um, or do I need to do the portfolio thing? Uh, not at the moment. So which university are you with? Uh, university of Essex. Yeah, so they're, they're going through the process, but they haven't been accredited yet. So what will happen is, when a university becomes accredited, um, when you pass that course, the HI will send you the link to the, um, the HE portal where you will upload your certificate to enable you to go on, but it's only when they're accredited. Now, we've said um, any practitioners, ideally who've been on program since 2017, that's probably the most ideal to wait. I think that you're more likely that your HI will get through that accreditation process and you'll be able to go through that than having to do the portfolio. If you're very keen and eager and want to get it on it sooner, then you, you'd be able to do the portfolio route. Um, yeah. None, and I've just seen none of our HIs have currently been accredited. Um, 
that there's this 300 programs. I think currently they're up to 28 have been nationally. So it is going to take a couple of years. We've got, um, I think ARU is the end of this year is what they're looking for. Um, Bedford also isn't um, accredited yet. So we will let you know, but it, if you're on the course now, if it's accredited mm -hmm. within the next couple of years, because it's been, the course has been validated during that time, those that were previous students as well as then the new students will also then automatically get onto that register via that route. So what we're generally saying at the moment is that anyone who's on a current course, who's been on a course since 2017, probably just hold off. You can have the conversation with your organisation to say, we know the HIs are going through the accreditation process um, and we should be able to join that way. We will keep you up to date if, the, if there's any issues with the HIs or anything like that, we'll, we'll let you know. But realistically, that's going to be the easiest way for you to get on that, that register because we're working very closely with the, with the courses to ensure that they do map against the more professional framework and we'll get through that accreditation process. Um, it's anyone probably prior to that 2017 where the portfolio route would be more, more suitable realistically. Um, but like I said, OU has just come into our remit and they are asking for accreditation date. So they're also working towards towards that process. So I said that there's none that aren't working towards. Um, what we're struggling with is, is getting those dates into the centre because obviously there are, I think, 58 universities and 300 programmes and each individual program has to go through in their own right. So it's just going to take a little bit of time. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Could I add something, please? Um, because now I'm a little bit confused here because. Um, right, so I was doing the um, going to do the credential in through the RCN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying here, obviously, I know it's a union, but um, I'm not doing any courses like I mean, I've done so many things over the years and just want to do this to put my credentialing through to see if I can be um, accepted onto the register through my current and my past experience and knowledge in that. So is it OK to carry on to do it through the RCN or should I wait to do it through one of your other absolutely, absolutely fine for you to carry on through the through the RCN. Um, the difference at the moment through the RCN compared to what I know our directory is that it has to be level seven. So even if it's, and I'm not saying necessarily a master's module, but the way that you interpret the evidence, how you reflect on that and how it's impacted on practice needs to be written to that level seven. So it's the analysis, it's the critical awareness and thinking and the application that is key. And I don't think within the RCN, because I think it is also those level six that they, so that's where there's slight differences between the two. However, if you get your credential in, realistically, a lot of that evidence will then be applicable and could easily be transferred across to the the, the portal and, and the portfolio when it when it's open. So I wouldn't say no, don't don't do it at all. I think it's great to be credentialed by by you know the Royal College of Nursing that that's not a problem. Um, but we also know they don't directly map. So you getting credentialed now will not guarantee that you when when the RCN and the, do actually map against historical won't go on because we know it doesn't map unless then the RCN did some work to go well actually this was the only couple of pieces that we were missing if all of our then credentials could meet that uh, we might be able to then do that kind of yes okay as long as you make up that difference we would then uh, enable it to go to, to go on the register so there's still areas of work that needs to be looked at with that um, but I would but certainly I say being point credentialed point. by the RCN is, is oh sorry Is that OK? I thought I heard someone coming through then. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit confused about it because um, like, I mean, I've done lots of different modules over the years and um, you're still not given the A and P title as such. That, that's down to your organisation that you're working with. So although you can have the training, if, if the organisation doesn't need the role, we have no governance or, or say in that. So what you need to be doing is if you can evidence 
this is this is the level of knowledge that I have. These are the skills that I can have. This is my increased scope of practice that you should have the advanced nurse practitioner title. Then that's the conversation you need to be having with your 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 organisation, your practice. You know, that's why we've now put in place that you can't we wouldn't allow or allocate the funding unless we know that there's a role at the end of it and the business case has been done because historically within the use we know that a lot of this funding has been used for CPD and it hasn't directly increased the AP workforce and that's what we need to see an increase in advanced practice workforce so that's the conversation you'd need to be having so I would you know having the credentialing being able to evidence the level of skills and knowledge that you have and having that conversation with your practice manager that's the way you'd need to go because your job description and your job title would need to change and whatever appropriate scope of practice to wrap around that because that's a liability issue really so that needs to be a joint conversation with your practice manager okay thank you and i've just seen um when is the acp course starting how do you apply so acp courses within our region start either in september or january dependent upon the, the hei to apply you need to first of all have um agreement with your like i said practice your your organization because they have to agree that you would have a role at the end of it an advanced practice role at the end of it and then if you let the training hubs know that's how we do the scoping. So twice a year we go out from HEE to the training hubs and say how many, you know, full top ups and uh, at some point the portfolios will be added on there. Um, do you need for each training hub? So it's up to the organisations to then come through and, and let them know that demand. And then that comes to HEE and we look at that and we will then be able to allocate depending upon our budget so much training out into the systems. So this year's for 22-23 the first scoping has already been and gone however we are coming back out in January so if you make you know if, if there are individuals who want to go on this pathway now is the time to start having those conversations with the training hubs because we will be coming back out in January so even though we've got the initial numbers for what we need to go forward for funding requests nationally there is still time to actually change that allocation and for us to kind of review the applications in, in January, February. There are a few questions, Katie, about when um, which universities have been accredited and I believe you've answered them. So there's questions about ARU, Bedford and OU. Yeah, like I said, all, all, going, all going through um, the process, we, we are working. So uh, Amanda Gibson, who uh, uh, supervision assessment leaders working very closely with all of the HIs, they're mapping against their programs and, and they're all looking at trying to get dates. Like I said, we've got three, so now I've got to think it's Harperture, ARU, who's that other one that's going through end of this year, beginning of next year. I'm just trying to find out which one the other one is, I can't remember off the top of my head. But they are all going through the process. So if you're on the program, I, I wouldn't be concerned and, and you'd hit that validation period. So when they do get accredited, you'd then be able to um, you'd be given then signposted to the portal to be able to then get on that register. Let's see if I can find. Not quite sure of the question, which university will the HE ACP course be attached to? We currently will fund any HE ACP course. So as long as it's relevant to your, your practice and your organisation is supportive and the role is there at the end of it, we don't currently refuse any um, HIs. Yeah, but I'll yeah, put I'll it in the it. chat now. Our and practices, does, does anybody else find our practices, um, you know, offering this role at the end of it? Because I think a lot of them may be under the impression that, you know, once you get this, then you're going to go and um, do your own thing. And a lot of practices want nurses now with this AMP role to go as locum and work for them as locum nurses rather than as part of the actual 
been. I, I, and I think that's where the governance is changing. So previously, before we came into role, these role, it wasn't a requirement that you had a job at the end of it. But the reason we've stopped that is because we had we knew we had an awful lot of practitioners, first of all, who were quite upset by the fact that there was no role at the end of it after they've done three years of training. And it also means all the skills that you've developed realistically without that job description and that scope of practice, you can't utilise, which means you can't maintain them because from a professional liability point of view, it, you are leaving yourself open, as is the organisation. If you've got nothing to show how you've developed those skills and it's it's linked directly to your role and what your organisation says that role is, it is leaving you open, which is why we've now changed it. So we know there's a lot of people who will have to have those kind of conversations with the with the practice and organisations. From our point of view, we've now got a much more robust process in place so that if organisations want this funding, they will have to guarantee a, a job at the end of it. Um, so it, we are in that transitional phase at the moment. Katie, can I just comment on that? Yes. So I think there's a lot of confusion in general practice about what the advanced practice role is anyway. Um, and it's used very differently across different practices. And I think this will be a process which will give people the confidence in practices to say, yes, this, this, is, this role will fit into our practice and we know what we're looking for. We know what we, what we actually need. And I, I do take the point about locum. Of course, anybody can go out and do locum work if that's what they want to do. But I think, you know, from my own experience, I know some practices who have got no advanced practitioners and I know some who have got quite a lot of them. I know some GPs who know nothing about advanced practice at all, um, you know, and, and you, it's about that education, but it's difficult to educate somebody when you can't say this is it, this is what it looks like. Um, because there is so much variability out there. So I think this will actually improve practices willing, willing to take advanced practice um, roles on, definitely. And we're doing a lot of work. Like I said, one of the biggest roles we have now um, is, is that clear and tell what advanced practice is. You know, coming in, it, even though the, the framework was released in 2017, there's a huge vari variation of what people actually think it is. And we're working very closely with the training hubs so that we can get that messaging out so that people do know. And, and we are looking, at, I've, I have already developed and it's gone through to the training, we should have gone through to the training hubs, is the, the standardised ACP job description. It will mm. need to be amended slightly for, to the, the practitioner's needs, but the core skills under each four pillars are there and it should start that standardisation, which is what, what we need. There's always going to be slight specialities or, or certain key areas that people will develop further in and that, that's great. That's not a problem. What we're saying is that as a core, these are what skills these roles should should be having. This is the level that they should be working at. Mm -hmm. um, and it is it is a process. And that's why I said it's very it needs to be supportive. We've got people with advance in their title. We need to ensure that actually they are working at that level. So it might mean that they need more clinical support or clinical training or academic support or training, and it's ensuring that we can help to support and deliver that. Um, so I'm just going to look at the last two. So thank you, Catherine, for showing that. That's really positive that there's um, a keenness to develop the role um, and succession and forward planning, really, to make sure that everybody's prepared. Um, and to answer the second question, so yes, the MSc courses are a combination of academic um, and workplace learning. Um, so as Katie said, we will, HE will fund um, any university essentially that is running an MSc programme and the contact time at the university for lecture will at the minimum be a day a week, but that will vary from HEI to HEI. And I think what we found with COVID is a lot of them have actually moved it. So it is blended learning and a lot of it is more now distance learning to the face. of it. There are some programmes that like the prescribing, you have to have a certain amount of face to face lectures. A lot of it is work based learning and, and what you're um, developing those skills while you're at work, but they are then allocated days. Um, so what I, it, yeah, it depends on the university. They are slightly different with how they run, but what I would say is we've seen a huge change over from COVID and I can't see that necessarily changing actually because some practitioners prefer it. It gives them the freedom to access it when they need to access it around, you know, the whole work-life balance. It does make it a lot easier. Um, all of our unis within the region have ACP, either full masters or apprenticeship courses. 
all we ask for is if you do want to go out of region, we just ask the reason why. Now there are some, um, so now I know the neonatal programme that it, some universities outside of region have specific programmes, so often it's a speciality where they want that, that kind of programme. Again, no issues. The reason we ask is that what we want to be able to do is be in a position where all of our HEIs provide what you need as practitioners and what organisations need from our practitioners. So we funded a few just this year that will go out of region and again we don't have an issue. All we'd ask is what's the reasoning behind it or why? Because then I can make sure that we're developing what, what you need within our HIs going forward. Um, it will just be so the, the governance is changing as in our governance is changing. So we will have a document coming out. So from HEE regarding the funding, we have commissioning guidance that are coming out. And as part of that, an organisation will we have we've got uh, organisational readiness checklist. But as part of us enabling the funding, we will state um, you have to send back the practitioners names, the role they're in. You will then have to say that yes you guarantee that there will be a role at the end of it if you say no when we look at prioritizing they're less likely to we're less likely to approve that funding to be honest it, we, we are going to be looking at so it will come from that like i said hopefully end of september it's just been finally reviewed by the commissioners on the the metic time frame um but other than that it's all ready to go so it the governance as in is from our point of view we, we are making it more robust you will have to provide evidence before we will give that funding going forward. OK, I think we're, we're at two o'clock. I think that covers everything. We will do more of these um, we will be sending out some feedback forms. So please let us know what was relevant, what wasn't, what more information do you need? Because then we can pull it forward to you. Make sure you're linked to your training hubs. Make sure if you haven't just sign up to the main list because anything new that comes out from regional regarding documentation or national will go through that mailing list. So it's the easiest way of just keeping up to date. Um, but also you've got Marie's email, you've got our faculty email. Any questions, please, we're here to help. So happy to kind of follow anything up. OK, thank, so you. thank you everyone.